my presentation tonight is on climate change and how climate both affects and is affected by our ecosystems, including the vast forests and wetlands in northern Ontario. I also take the opportunity to briefly introduce my research program at, uh, at Laurentian that Valerie um, already introduced that focuses on um, the poorly understood but very important microbial communities in the soils of these ecosystems. So this is the makeup of our atmosphere, and the vast majority of, the vast majority of it is molecular nitrogen and oxygen. But there's other gases present just in trace amounts that have the characteristic of allowing wavelengths of light to pass through, but then trapping longer wavelengths of heat that's radiated back from the Earth's surface. And these are, of course, the greenhouse gases. And without them, the Earth would be much colder, about 30 degrees colder. All the water on Earth would freeze, and life, at least as we know it, wouldn't exist. So these are the concentrations of these gases. So pr pr primarily carbon dioxide that drives the long-term greenhouse effect, but also methane and nitrous oxide play roles. And it's the concentration over the last 2,000 years. And scientists were able to recreate this or reconstruct this by analyzing bubbles of air that were trapped in well-preserved ice cores taken from places like the Greenland ice sheet. And you see that you know, things were pretty stable uh, until we started mining and combusting large amounts of fossil fuels. Agriculture started expanding and other land use change. And of course, this was compounded by uh, and still is compounded by very rapid population growth, and these concentrations are all now quite high. Well, what has this done? This figure is showing the global average temperature of the Earth for the last 130 or so years, and it's expressed as a difference from the average over this period and then any given year. So a value or a point on this graph that's below zero represents a colder than average year, and a value above zero represents a warmer than average year. We can see a few things. First, that we haven't had a colder than average year now in 37 years. Temperature has been rising quite rapidly in the last few decades. And we're now up about 0.5 or 0.6 degrees above this average. Well, what does that mean? Half a degree Celsius doesn't sound like a lot, but considering this applies to the entire Earth, it's an enormous amount of extra energy that's trapped at the Earth's surface. Um, and it's also important to point out that this isn't evenly distributed. There's some areas that aren't warming, and there's other areas that are warming quite rapidly, including the higher latitudes of the northern hemisphere, uh, such as Ontario's far north. And this massive amount of extra energy also changes how precipitation occurs, so rainfall and snowfall. It's beginning to alter ocean, current, ocean circulation and ocean currents and even sea level. Well, I lost a... I've lost a slide here. So the question that was going to pop up in white with a black background said, why do we know that human release greenhouse gases are causing climate change? Um, and rather than just circumstantial evidence of, well, we're putting gases in the atmosphere that we know trap heat and we're seeing extra heat, um, there's some less circumstantial evidence too. So we fundamentally understand why and how climate changes naturally. So climate does vary cyclically, and it's fundamentally driven by the relationship between the sun and the Earth and how much solar energy reaches the Earth. So the Earth's orbit around the sun changes. It goes from being more circular to being more elliptical, a kind of a squished circle. And also how far the Earth tilt, tilts on its axis changes cyclically over time. So you get these climate change cycles varying on about 1,000 to 100,000 year time scales that are uh, you know, all driven by there being more or less solar energy reaching different parts of the Earth. Well, we know we're in a warm period, but we also know we're not in a period that should be getting warmer rapidly. So the only other explanation is it's the heat, the, the energy that we're receiving is being trapped in the Earth. There's also climate models, so global climate models that are large-scale models of the circulation of the atmosphere and the oceans. And these are very useful for predicting what future climates are going to look like under, say, twice the amount of CO2 that we have today. But they're also quite useful for discerning what's controlling contemporary climate and recent past climate. And, and we have very good temperature and precipitation records for these. And all of these are pointing directly at the changing composition of the atmosphere and greenhouse gases, not at, for example, extrasolar energy reaching the Earth. Another compelling line of evidence is that now that we have satellites that can measure the temperature of our stratosphere, our upper atmosphere, we're seeing that the stratosphere is cooling. Well. The explanation for that is there's more heat being trapped in the lower atmosphere in the troposphere. It's not radiating back towards the upper atmosphere, and you're seeing proportional amounts of cooling in the upper atmosphere that can only be explained by these greenhouse gases. Well, we're already starting to see climate change express itself at least in certain regions. 
And beyond just increased temperatures, there's been altered precipitation, so rainfall and snowfall. Uh, more frequent occurrence of extreme weather in some areas, so both storms and droughts. Altered water levels of lakes and of groundwater. And all these changing conditions affect how our ecosystems function. So for example, change the rate at which plants grow, so how productive our ecosystems are. Change how microorganisms break down dead plant tissues and release nutrients that are vital for the regrowth of the next generation of plants. Change how resistant or how susceptible to natural disturbance that would occur, occur naturally. So things like wildfires and droughts, and even attacks by native pests. And a, a main example of this in Canada is the mountain pine beetle. So this is a, a, an insect that's a native pest uh, that would, would attack lodgepole pine. And it's normally kept in check because there would be a cold winter every few years and the population would be knocked back. Well, we haven't had a cold winter, or at least central BC hasn't had a cold winter in decades. This population has skyrocketed and there's an area now more than twice the size of New Brunswick of standing dead lodgepole pine in central BC waiting to burn. Um, it's not just our forests and our fiber supply that are potentially at risk too. So climate change affecting our agricultural systems and our freshwater aquatic systems also potentially puts at risk our food supply and our water security. Well, it's not a one-way street. So as well as climate impacting ecosystem functioning, ecosystem, you know, ecosystems are going to feed back and shape what climate change looks like too. And why is this? I'm missing some things on this slide. So here it should have said, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide, so the three greenhouse gases going out. Um, so it's fundamentally because our terrestrial biosphere and our surface oceans exchange these greenhouse gases with the atmosphere. When plants grow, they take up carbon dioxide, they fix that carbon into their tissues, into their biomass, and then when these tissues die, microorganisms break them down and re-release carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. If a system is flooded and anoxic, these microbes can also release methane and nitrous oxide. And this is just the natural breathing of life. Carbon goes in and carbon goes out every year. To give you a sense of the magnitude of this, though, um, we emit about 8 billion tons of carbon dioxide carbon by burning fossil fuels each year globally. But the natural take up and release of carbon dioxide by our biosphere is about 20 times that. So any slight change in how our biosphere functions could result in you know, a small, a, a, a net uptake of extra carbon or a net release of extra carbon. And luckily we're in a period right now where our biosphere seems to be sequestering or taking in more carbon than it releases and mitigating some of the extra greenhouse, or the extra fossil fuel CO2 in the atmosphere. This is a good point just to describe that this is the, the decomposition side of this cycle of life is where my research group works. So we study the microorganisms that produce these greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide. Under the right conditions, there's microorganisms that can consume some of these. They recycle nutrients, they cycle pollutants. And it's a pretty exciting field. So um, it's been shown that in a, a single sample of soil, so a small handful of soil, there's as many as a million different bacterial species. So not a million organisms, there's billions and billions of organisms, but a million different species. Now globally, from every environment, including the human body and animal bodies, scientists have only isolated and grown in the lab fewer than 10,000. So there's a lot of room for discovery here. Well, this map showing uh, the main ecoregions of, of Ontario. And we really have an enormous slice of the global biosphere. You could nearly fit Spain and France into our area, yet we have one-eighth of their population. And my group works across both of the major forested regions, so the North Temperate Great Lakes St. Lawrence Forest, with key species like sugar maple and yellow birch and white pine, also into the boreal forest where conifers tend to predominate more, jack pine, spruce. And we also work in wetlands, so that are, that are scattered throughout these two forest regions, but are also in moving into the, the Hudson Bay Lowlands. That's the third largest wetland on Earth that's sitting at the top of this map. So first to talk about forests. Um, there don't appear to be any dire consequences right now of climate change impacting Ontario's central and northern forests the way it's happening in BC. Um, but forests and forestry have a potentially big role to play in combating climate change. So the forestry sector is in Ontario, but across all of North America, is already the largest producer of bioenergy. Most of that energy is used internally in the industry, but more and more it's being used externally. So for example, the Ontario Power Generation is in the process of converting the Atacocan, formerly coal, thermal generating plant to uh, woody biomass. This is good for the atmosphere because, yes, you burn wood, you release carbon dioxide, but 
as long as the forest regrows, that carbon dioxide is taken back up. It's also good for forest-dependent communities in central and northern Ontario. There's been massive downturns in this industry in the last decade, so uh, more than 100,000 direct and indirect jobs lost. So you know, any new access to green bioenergy markets is going to be, going to be good. And a key focus of my research group and that of my colleagues is to try to de determine how to manage forests to produce extra bioenergy, but without losing the key factor of uh, um, sustainability that's essential to have modern forestry in Ontario that people are happy with. So now out of the forest and into the bog, so the picture you're looking at here is an aerial view of part of the Hudson Bay lowlands in Ontario's far north. So again, this is the third largest wetland in the world. And wetlands are important for a number of reasons. So they can filter pollutants, they can mitigate the damage from floods, and they also store an enormous amount of fresh water. But peatlands, the type of wetlands that predominate here and across Ontario, also store carbon. So the, the, the picture that you're looking at on the right is a surface meter of peat soil, and it's dead plant material that hasn't decomposed. And the conditions are unique and arguably harsh, such that microbes can't re-release this carbon back to the atmosphere as CO2. They cover about 3% of the Earth's land surface, so they're relatively minor by area globally, but they cover maybe 15 to 20% of our local uh, landscape in Sudbury, and 98% of the land surface in the Hudson Bay lowlands in Ontario's far north. Um, to give you a sense of how much carbon they've stored, it's about two-thirds the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere is CO2 that basically makes our Earth habitable and sustains the greenhouse effect. So they're very, very much hot spots for climate change ecosystem feedbacks, and ones that we don't fully understand, but we really need to. This is, these are really carbon-dense ecosystems. They also seem to be very susceptible to environmental change. So they're wetlands, and drought dries them out, and when the wet, wetlands dried out, it functions very differently. In this case, that allows microbes to break down this carbon and release it. They're also susceptible to an atmospheric pollution, and particularly in Ontario's far north, permafrost melt. So where we're losing permafrost quite rapidly, it's drastically changing these ecosystems. So the next few slides are just pictures of this landscape. So um, only about 2% of the land surface is upland forest. The rest is peatland, and it's interspersed with many shallow lakes. The wetlands and the aquatic systems are really in, you know, intimately connected and influence the water quality of each other. And uh, these pictures are from uh, a master's student at the Living with Lakes Center, Joseph McLeod, who's supervised by Bill Keller and John Gunn, whom you just heard from, um, who got to conduct his research in this remote and unique, but arguably very, very important uh, landscape. So I'm nearing the end of my talk, and I'll conclude by saying that there's a lot of work left to be done to understand how climate change is going to impact our ecosystems and what that means for water and fiber and food security. And even more complex and perplexing is how ecosystems are going to feed back and in turn shape our future climate and shape what climate change looks like. But it's important, you know, so it's important to look at these impacts and feedbacks. But I think mitigation also needs to be at the forefront. And uh, Canada is really the worst offender now on the global stage in terms of refusal to deal with reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Um, I think it's short-sighted. Uh, it's arguably unfair to um, countries whose populations use far less food and fuel resources than we use per capita. It's unfair to large emitting countries that are putting massive resources into CO2 reduction strategies, primarily in Western Europe. It's also unfair to communities in Canada that live in the areas that are going to be most affected in the near term by climate change, whether it's the north or whether it's even just central British Columbia. Um, so these top two quotes are... Uh, from you know, the federal environment, environment minister had just returned from the UN climate change summit in Warsaw in November. They're pretty depressing. Well, I don't want to leave you depressed tonight, so I'll say it's not all bad news. And you know, despite what's not going on at the federal level, Canada's three largest provinces, and arguably with Ontario at the forefront, uh, are doing a lot in the right direction and having some, some great success. So Ontario is now the only large um, jurisdiction in North America that's fully... Um, removed coal from its power supply. And especially that they're looking to replace this with things like renewable energy leaves me with a lot of hope. So with that, I'll end and thank you very much. <laughs>